African Export-Import Bank, the trade finance bank for Africa. Africa, perhaps the only continent often erroneously judged and perceived as a single entity failing to reflect the rich diversity of the 54 countries which make up one of the world's wealthiest continents in terms of natural resources. It is ironic, therefore, that Africa plays an unimpressive role in global trade, contributing a mere 2.4%. This is Africa Trade Lines. Thank you for joining us. On this episode, we'll take a look at Africa's strategies for internal trade as well as its relations with other regions across the world. I am Christy Kolpopola. Welcome. The International Trade Administration says foreign trade represents more than 50% of the GDP in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. This signifies a great dependency on imports, which are not adequately balanced by corresponding exports. As Africa strives to position itself in the global economy, its trade strategies with developed and emerging countries is still unclear. We have lots of agreements, but when it comes to implementation, the rate is rather disappointing. I think that opens the, the, the window for that question. Do we really have that policy? Do we internalize all these principles that we sign on to before we do that? Are those principles mainstreamed within the national trade policies and other policies that influence? I think that's the missing link. Africa, in my mind, doesn't really have a, you know, a formal trade strategy. What we've done is we have remnants of the colonial peace. You know, our trade relationships are more defined by our historical relationships. So, you know, West Africa, Anglophone Africa has, you know, trade relationships with France. East Africa region has trade relationships with the UK. So I think we need to move away from those old relationships and start focusing on largely forming new bilateral trade agreements with partners in either Asia or even Latin America. And sort of move away from what I call a little bit of a haphazard uh, trade strategy that we've been having to date. According to trade analysts, it remains a huge challenge to expand the continent's export basket to include more processed and manufactured products. Services on average account for 60% of the gross domestic product. But when you look at those services, they are not tradable services because they are not linked to uh, production, to the value chain, you know, etc. And hence, uh, what needs to be done simultaneously, uh, because the markets have already been opened up, is to focus on, you know, industrialization. World market for cocoa and cocoa products is estimated about 120, 130 billion dollars. Africa produces slightly under 80 percent of cocoa. Is it gets about eight billion dollars uh, because there's no value addition to cocoa. So that's the kind of relationship you see across most of the products. Well, where we are because uh, we have remained extractive economies because what we are producing is what we don't consume and we consume what we don't produce and this has been the historical trend of uh, the structure of African economies and if we don't you know transform these economic structures industrialize then we're not going to be able to to make it advanced economies across Europe and Asia have until 2013 been Africa's main trading partners since then, more than half of Africa's trade is reported to be with other continents emerging and developing economies. Economic experts say this trade redirection has not been matched by diversified exports from Africa. Oil and commodities, which include precious stones, cocoa and ores, have been key U.S. imports from Africa. But the USA increased their royal production, and these imports slipped from $98 billion in 2010 to a low 
of $22 billion in 2016. Analysts say Africa's trade potential is curbed by declining and undiversified exports, which are mainly natural resources, as well as weak value addition and limited research, amongst others. A continent that is well resourced doesn't get so much. A continent that has so many people, young people, has uh, the, uh, uh, the, the most expansive arable land, water, and so on, is the poorest continent. It, it tells you that the trade relations are against it. Africa is really on the sidelines of all the large, you know, preferential trade areas, such as the transatlantic uh, investment partnership, um, etc. So I think if we start to really understand where we sit in the global picture of trade, that's when we realize that trading with ourselves really should be the first, the first step forward in terms of formalizing trade strategies. There is the issue of competitiveness, which is driven or influenced largely by the challenges of infrastructure. Because in Nigeria, for instance, infrastructure is a very big issue. You have challenges with power, for instance. You have challenges with logistic transportation. You know, and sometimes you have also challenges with the issue of foreign exchange and the rest of that because quite a number of our industries are also unfortunately import dependent. So each time we have a crisis with commodity prices, it affects our foreign reserves, it affects our exchange rate, then it affects the capacity of domestic production in many of the industries. For years, economic development positions the European Union as Africa's biggest single trade customer. But over the last decade, the continent's trade geography shifted from Europe to Asia. While Europe accounted for over 30% of Africa's global trade in 2015, consulting firm McKinsey in its 2017 report, Dance of the Lions and Dragons, says China's economic influence on Africa is wider than perceived. The Asian continent's trade relations with Africa has grown at about 20% per year since 2000. Its annual foreign direct investment took a 40% leap over the last 10 years. From holding 8th and 9th position as Africa's largest trading partners in 2000, China and India are now 1st and 2nd. How does this reflect on Africa's global trade strategies? It's up to the African countries to negotiate based on their own interest. They will negotiate in their own interest. But let me tell you, if not for the Chinese, would you have the kind of infrastructure investment we have today? Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the development we've seen in terms of the rails, in some of the roads, the ports, the airports, power stations, across the continent happened because uh, trade with China uh, expanded. They have very generous incentives that, you know, support the Chinese investors who want to come to Africa. It has a lot of adverse implications because if you talk to an average local producer today, the biggest challenge to an African industrialist, and in Nigeria in particular, is Chinese products because they cannot just compete with products coming from China. Some of the Chinese uh, importers also have this strategy. They look at the market, they look at the purchasing power, they look at the pyramid, the economic pyramid, and they see that the bulk of the market is at the level of those who are at the bottom of the pyramid. They, they, they train a lot of very cheap products. You're watching Africa Trade Lines. We have been looking at intra-African trade as well as the continent's commercial relations with the rest of the world. After the break, we'll take a look at why trade in Africa is often described as a representation of extremes. We'll also look at the potential for optimizing the continent's trade strategies. African Export Import Bank, the African Export Import Bank, the trade finance bank for Africa.
Many African countries are subscribed to several free trade agreements. One of such is the United States AGOA. There is also the joint Africa-EU strategy. But there are concerns about the wider implications of these trade arrangements on Africa's trade. What then must Africa do to ensure a structurally and mutually beneficial relations with these countries and continents as it strives to position itself within the global market? Getting you know, North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa closer together and understand that we're all in this together as one continent and that we need to create these stronger ties in order to, to together grow the continent. That's what I'm hoping will come out of this. Within the EAC, there's still what we call non-tariff barriers. So barriers to trade that come up that are outside what has been agreed on paper. And again, to really resolve those issues, it requires sitting down, working with the private sector, not just the public sector, to remove those tariff, uh, those non-tariff barriers to trade to encourage regional trade to flow. Uh, we cannot, in an area like West Africa, like Central Africa, uh, try to address the power issue uh, in individual countries. We need to uh, see how to mutualize that, to address it at the regional level. It will be uh, easier to invest in big infrastructure, it will lower the cost, and we need also in that regional integration to create connectivity to be sure that logistic and transport costs will move down. It is no country in the world or region in the world that has ever developed without uh, industrialization. And in any case, if we don't do it now when we have the window of opportunity, even to take advantage of the 85 million jobs that are relocating uh, from China, uh, that are labor intensive, then we'll miss the opportunity because the fourth industrial revolution is one that is uh, driven by 3D technology. It is driven by digitization of all economic activities. So we need to take that window of opportunity now in order for us to move forward. In China, China that over the years following the globalization that happened in the past 25 years, became the manufacturing hub of the world, has developed. So labor costs have gone up. So they also want to delocalize. Uh, delocalizing means that the industries that are labor intensive have to go somewhere else. Who else is better placed to take these jobs, uh, if not Africa? The European Union has recently proposed an economic partnership agreement which establishes a free trade zone between Africa and Europe. Industry controversy revolves around whether or not this poses a threat to the development of trade on the continent. I understand that uh, the um, farmers are concerned that uh, they could be uh, overwhelmed by importation from France, but well, if it, it, it will be not the, ca the case, but if uh, it will, well, actually, there are in the agreement safeguards to stop the importation from Europe to uh, Nigeria. So, no way that Nigeria could be overwhelmed by product coming from uh, Europe. We need to look at those elements in the EPA uh, that uh, are the key sources of worry to the domestic uh, industrialists. You know, uh, I believe that in terms of machinery and things, uh, Europe really offers quality machinery that can help the development and even industrialization of many African countries. You know, but again, these fears about competitiveness, about European products coming to Africa to possibly crowd out the, the, the domestic industries, I think those fears need to be addressed. We try to help the countries working with the European Union, you know, to develop their own production for their own and to export them. It's to the benefit of all because we are still a liberal economy. But the truth is if we had uh, better infrastructure, some power in West Africa and economic integration, we're the big market. Like if you think about how trade works, what's the most valuable chip at the trade bargaining table is being a big market. Um, and of course, we're f over 400 million people in West Africa, 
in, in, in uh, Africa as a whole. Sub-Saharan Africa is going to two billion, so we're going to be the big market. Uh, and if, as we become richer, that market just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the chip that we have in those. So I think that the future is bright for us, but it's a question of getting in those enabling features to be able to take advantage of being the big player in the block. And in one sense, Europe needs Africa more than Africa needs Europe in terms of its uh, development. The African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA, is another hot topic. This program provides duty-free market access to imports into the U.S. of certain products from AGOA-eligible sub-Saharan African countries. Although this agreement between the U.S. and sub-Saharan Africa has existed since year 2000, the region is yet to see a resultant leap in global exports. Some specific businesses that export some agricultural uh, products that have benefited from it, but it's on a small scale. I mean, it's a, a bilateral agreement um, maybe like between the U.S. and you know, individual countries. If you can meet the standards, you know, they, there's no duties. I mean, that's fantastic. I think, I think the U.S. genuinely wanted to help. But again, it's not, it's, it's not on a scale that you kind of have like a global sort of industry. If, if you are not able to compete, even when you are offered free access in terms of trade, just as you have with uh, under Agua, you know, we have a lot of uh, access to, uh, to American markets, U.S. markets specifically. But how many countries are able to take advantage of it? Not many countries. In Nigeria, for instance, we couldn't take advantage of Agua because there was nothing to offer. We are beginning to see protectionism coming. America is gradually pulling back. They suspended activity with the They pulled out of the, uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement, renegotiating uh, NAFTA, and reviewing all the other agreements they've entered into, including Agua, as we understand it. So it is likely that the world will move from multilateralism to bilateralism. And if you go to bilateralism, it means that only the, the strongest will win all the time. And the African countries individually are very weak, they are small and, this, and fragmented. But when they are together, we are now talking of a continent uh, with an economic size of about $3.3 trillion, trade of more than $1 trillion, population of more than 1 billion people. It becomes a formidable force. In a bid to integrate the continent and promote solid intra-regional trade, African heads of states have agreed to the concept of a common currency, an African Union passport, and a continental free trade zone. Industry experts say the continental free trade zone will add value and empower Africa, paving the way for the continent to become a future core market. Africa is the most fragmented continent in the, in the world. It's difficult to say you have a clear strategy. And we are now happy that uh, the leaders have realized this and have decided to uh, have the Corneta Free Trade Area completed quickly. Just last week, negotiations for the framework agreement was concluded in Niger. And we expect that it will be signed early next year. The CFT will be the first step towards Africa having a real trade strategy to trade with itself. But I think we all have to be aware of the fact that it will take a while before, um, before it's implemented in a way that we want it to look like. I'll just give you an example of Comesa so that we are, we are practical. When we launched our free trade area in 2000, our trade was uh, 3.2 billion in terms of intra you know, imports. Uh, it went up to 12 billion, it has come down to 9.2 billion. So if you have uh, removed all the tariffs, you are trading duty-free, quota-free. What it tells you is that it's not sustainable for us to sustain uh, the integration of African economies. Uh, we need to have the following pillars. Obviously, market integration is part of the, an important pillar of which uh, we are talking about but industrialization is key, infrastructure and services. So go to look at the common currency thing. It probably can work, but we have decided to do something. So what we are doing 
is we are building a platform which will launch very soon that will make it possible for Africans to pay for inter African trade they get in their local currency. So we begin to harden African local currencies by doing that. Uh, and when people begin to pay for goods bought across borders in their local currency, then they begin to see uh, that maybe it doesn't really matter if we have one currency. Our central banks need to start talking to each other. Currently they're not. They need to find a way to find a platform where they integrate a payment system where you can actually convert currencies from one country to another without going through a third barter currency like the euro or like the yen or like the dollar. Visas are always an issue. I'm Angolan. I require to have a visa to go anywhere in the world. And it is, a, it is a hurdle. It is a hurdle because you need to take a fast business decision. You need to be there that day or the next day. You're not going to think about it three weeks in advance. So we can think about having a simple system, which is visa on arrival for business people who are coming for three, four days, short stays, seven days. And if we start recognizing that there actually are African businessmen, African businesswomen that have the need for that service, I think that would be a great change. In terms of the ideal, it's very easy to write down and get to note whatever this means. But when you get to implementation, you realize, for example, that East Africa, at the beginning, there were three countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. Negotiating the customs union protocol took four years between three countries. Then we had Rwanda and Burundi coming on board. So they adopted largely what had been agreed. That was fairly easy. And then you have South Sudan. But you get to realize that the bigger the, bigger the group, the more difficult it is for, ease to, to, for implementation to happen very easily. Manufacturing's trade profile in Africa has often been undiversified. Reports point to an unsustainable dependency on extractive industries which are driven by unsophisticated technology. While the rest of the world discuss the fourth industrial revolution, Africa is at best waiting. There are a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, about robotics, uh, beginning to take the jobs that human beings ought to do. But it's unlikely that those will have big, big impacts in the, the very near future. So Africa has that advantage. Given that, because the, 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 the Chinese themselves want to delocalize, to relocate those industries, because they moved up the development chain. In Africa, we need a strong industrialization strategy where we're focusing on skills, making sure that our manufacturing sector has real skills where employees can, you know, can produce you know, within light manufacturing. One of the big barriers to market integration here is knowledge. So someone wants something, there's someone else who makes it or something that they, they could make it and they're in another na neighboring African country. In the past, you wouldn't have the knowledge that that was going on. So you would be looking to Europe or you look to North America, or you look to China to source that product. But uh, because of the technology explosion, that's no longer the case. And I know there's a lot of groups, including Afrin uh, Exim uh, Bank, that's really focused on this inter-Africa trade, recognizing it's not just about credit, it's also about information. So how do you find people that can be connected. But the other part of it, of course, is if you're connected to someone you don't know, there's not a high degree of trust. So there's another technology that's critical to this, which is blockchain. So what is the blockchain all about? Well, I mean, today we, most people think it's about the price of Bitcoin. But what it's really about is, is ways of establishing trust between people who have no reason to establish trust. So if we can make that work uh, on the continent, then we're going to see a lot more intra-Africa trade. Without doubt, developing successful trade strategies rests on Africa's ability to look inwards and fix its trade challenges, some of which experts have analyzed to include 
regional integration issues, infrastructure issues, and of course, demonstrated commitments to abiding by reforms. With these in place, experts are confident that Africa can achieve a mutually beneficial trade relations within itself and with continents across the globe. And that's it on this episode of Africa Trade Lines. Many thanks for watching. I am Christy Cole Pupola. African Export Import Bank, the trade finance.